So uh, you guys who come around a lot will recognize Guy Snodgrass down in the corner of my screen. He's, he's addressed this, this group once before. Guy is a, a 98 Naval Academy grad. He's an F-18 guy uh, with a squadron command tour under his belt. But in his last tour before he retired from the Navy, Guy was the chief speechwriter to Secretary of Defense James Mad Dog Mattis. And he talked about that in his book, Holding the Line Inside Trump's Pentagon with Secretary Mattis. So this is what he came to talk to us about last time. And if you're like me and you're into people with nicknames like Mad Dog, uh, you're going to have a certain set of expectations about what that must have been like. So if so, when you pick up that book, you're in for a surprise because what that experience was really about, metaphorically speaking, was trying to land a DC-10 on a carrier flight deck in heavy seas on a foggy night with busted instruments, except the ocean is made of molten lava, <laughs> right? So read the book. It's amazing. Uh, anyway, now Guy has released his next book, Top Guns, Top 10 Leadership Lessons from the Cockpit. It's just out on Amazon a couple of days ago, so I'm continuing my pattern and I haven't read it yet. Uh, but based on the last one, I have to say that my expectations are very high. So I think that's a good spot for Guy to come in and pick up the story. Guy, uh, I know you got a couple of slides. I'm going to make sure that you've got permission to share them. And the floor is yours, sir. Fantastic. Thanks again, Jason. Uh, appreciate it. And it says uh, currently you screen have, sharing is disabled. Have sharing permissions now. Thank you so much. All right. Let me pop this open. And let me know if you're seeing my screen. I do. All right, great. So um, like you mentioned, thanks again for the opportunity. It's great to be back with the Ring Knocker audience. Uh, I think that what you put together here is absolutely fantastic, right? I mean, you get people with a shared background and experience who can come together in a safe space and uh, frankly help each other out. And I've never seen Ring Knocker kind of as an opportunity for a sales pitch or, but I like the way you, you said it where, look, I mean, there's always people in this network who have needs and also have the ability to supply expertise or mentorship or other uh, access to their networks, et cetera. So I look forward to uh, thinking more deeply about that down the road and how I can contribute as well to help others. Right. But like you mentioned, I was a 1998 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. I uh, had the absolute pleasure of flying fighter aircraft for a majority of that time. I uh, started off in Baby Hornets F-18Cs. Uh, when I was a Top Gun instructor, I flew everything from A through F, as well as the Growler and the F-16 Fighting Falcon or the Viper. And then also uh, had a chance to go back, command a fighter squadron in Japan for my second tour in Japan. And then, as Jason mentioned, that's what led to uh, me winding up ultimately at the Pentagon working on Secretary Mass's personal staff as his uh, communications director and speechwriter. So that's a little bit of the background. And it's funny because, as I'm sure everyone on this, on this Zoom chat can relate, uh, so much in, in life is fate and timing, right? So you have a mental image of where you expect to go and what you want to accomplish and how you want to get there. And that lasts much like most plans for about maybe five, 10 minutes. And then suddenly an opportunity presents itself you didn't expect or something changes in your personal life and you're off in a different direction. And I would say that's basically proof positive uh, with me being a, a published author. Never would have seen that coming in a million years. And then the way fate and timing worked out when I left Secretary Mattis's office, there was an opportunity to publish the first book. And uh, that was, I think, more circum, you know, this circumstance and timing was right. But this book, the one that you just mentioned, Top Gun's Top 10, was something I was passionate about, even as a Top Gun instructor. So I thought what would be fun here is kind of two things. One, I was just going to share with you a little bit about the book uh, and kind of why I'm passionate about the project, but then also maybe take and widen the lens. There's a lot of really smart people on the call, people who've been out in industry far longer than I have. And I've been very surprised with some of the conversations I've had um, with companies, with organizations, veterans-focused organizations, since I've published books, because one thing that's nice about publishing, and it doesn't have to be a book, it could be an op-ed, it could be something you're passionate about, and you get it in your local paper or uh, in a trade uh, magazine, et cetera. But then suddenly when you do stuff like that, you kind of increase your profile, you start unlocking these really interesting conversations. And then what you find out is that some of the perspective on veterans or the perspective on, on the U.S. military is fairly skewed from what I think the reality is. So I'll share some of that in the second half of the uh, presentation. So like Jason mentioned, I mean, this is kind of the point of entry. This is why uh, Jason and I connected for tonight's uh, opportunity. Really appreciate Admiral Stavridis being a mentor. Uh, he, of course, has published a lot of books in his own right. So it gave me an opportunity to sync up with him um, through the U.S. Naval Institute and some other avenues. And uh, he's, he's always been a really polite champion. So I appreciate that. So one of the things I thought I'd do is just kind of share with you 
um, how the book came about, right? So it's, it, when you get it, it's nice in that it's a small form factor book. It's kind of what they call a giftable book. So it's not a 350 page tome. It's more like 200 pages, uh, slightly smaller. If, uh, if you've ever picked up a copy of McRaven's Make Your Bed, it's very similar to that. Um, and I did that on purpose because one thing I learned from the first go around is that, um, you know, you can have the message you want to get across to Americans, but it's, will they pick it up and will they read it? And so especially as we're thinking about uh, Veterans Day, or as we're thinking about uh, the holidays coming up, I wanted it to be something that, you know, men and women across America, not just military, but could see it and feel that it resonates with them and pick it up. And that's your avenue to start making an impact and to get your message out. So one of the stories that I share in the book that I just wanted to share with uh, those of you on the call, because I know we come from a service academy background, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we all come from a shared experiential background. So like I mentioned, uh, flying aircraft uh, for the majority of my time frame, and, and I know Chris Bug is on the line. I'm not sure if he was... I suspect you were with us on the uh, OIF cruise that we did on board USS George Washington back in around the 2004 timeframe. But as we were transiting over to Iraq, um, we had a sailor who was killed during that deployment. And I found out about it because I was airborne at the time and getting ready to come in for a night landing, excuse me, coming in for a night landing. So Suddenly, as we're overhead, the aircraft carrier, we're in the, the Marshall stack, and we start getting Delta four calls, right? So they're telling us to Delta, that means it's going to be a four minute delay. Suddenly, you get another Delta call. So these delays are stacking up and no one can, no one's telling us why that there are all these successive delays. And so ultimately, you know, some of the aircraft are having to hit the tanker to make sure they can stay airborne. We're all kind of scratching our heads. Uh, relatively uncommon to have such a prolonged delay. I think in this case, it was somewhere on the order of about 20, 25 minutes. So the the launch had been completed, but the recovery was stretching on forever. And it wasn't until I actually got down on the flight deck um, that I made my way to the ready room, took off my helmet, pulled out my earplugs and, and asked a buddy of mine who was in the ready room, like, what's going on? Why the delay? And he's like, oh yeah, you haven't heard. I mean, you just got on deck. Uh, a sailor was killed in the hangar bay. And the tragedy of this was the fact that uh, it was a completely avoidable accident. Um, you'd had an S3 that was parked in the hangar bay and it had basically cut a sailor in half. And so when you start peeling back the onion and you find out, well, how in the world did something like that happen? Um, what you realize is that they had moved the aircraft down. Of course, if you haven't spent much time on an aircraft carrier, this is one of the elevators. Uh, you can normally stick several aircraft on the elevator at the same time. And this is what allows you to get the aircraft from the flight deck, which is the top portion down into the hangar bay. And then of course, if you haven't spent much time in a hangar bay, it's congested. There's a lot of aircraft uh, that are that are located there and you have to spot them. I mean, it's very tight quarters. You're, you're kind of ducking and weaving as you go through from the, from the uh, front end to, to the back end of the ship. And so one of the things that, um, you know, happens on a routine basis is you have to chuck and chain the aircraft. And that's just a simple, you know, I mean, literally that's what you're doing. You're putting these, these plastic chocks uh, in front of and behind your nose wheel, as well as your both of your main landing gear wheels. And that'll help the aircraft from rolling, you know, too far. And then to make sure that it's incredibly tightened down, then you start putting chains on multiple points across the aircraft to the wings, to the landing gear, like you see here for the nose gear. And um, frankly, this is an area where, where you can grow complacent because you're doing it every time you move an aircraft to launch it, you break it down. Whenever it lands, you chain it again. It's happening multiple times a day, every single day on deployment. And so when you peel back the onion, or the onion, that's exactly what had happened. Um, a sailor had grown complacent in the hangar bay, had the chains on, kind of like the one you see maybe here on the far left side of the aircraft where it's kind of got some slack, it's bowed. And when the ship had made a fairly sudden turn, the, the plane, in this case an S3, had shifted forward and the wing of that aircraft had caught a sailor as he happened to be walking between the wall and the, or the wing and the bulkhead and uh, crushed him, cut him in half. Um, and so that was one of those, and I know we've all experienced these, these are one of those lessons where you're like, my gosh, you know, when they tell you in flight school or in some point of your career that there are lessons that are written in blood, this is truly one of those about the importance of not being complacent. Um, so that's what gave flight to one of the lessons in the book, which is do the right thing, even when no one is watching. So that was really the intent was to, to take experiences, to, to use storytelling as a vehicle whether it was specifically my time as a Top Gun instructor or whether it was uh, like this time shortly before I went to Top Gun as a, as a junior officer when I was on a combat cruise and we had a sailor killed. Uh, I also bring in some anecdotes from my time working for Secretary Mattis. Jason, I love the way you describe it. Uh, 
especially with the molten lava part. That's pretty accurate. So, you know, it's Washington, D.C. It's a pressure cooker uh, in and of itself. And then, of course, as you think about some of the challenges that have been present, presented uh, during the current administration on both sides of the aisle, uh, that, it, that it becomes even more, you know, you dial it up to an 11 in that case. So I think there's a lot of fun lessons in there. Uh, and so if you are so inclined, either for yourself, because you enjoy reading about these kinds of things, you enjoy leadership, and I know we all do, um, or because Veterans Day is coming up and, and you're thinking down towards uh, the Christmas time frame, uh, we'd be honored if you pick one up. All right, so that gets me to the second point, And I think this is going to be a little bit more fun for me, mainly because of the fact that I am a little bit on a fact-finding mission. Uh, like I alluded to earlier, when I interact with a lot of members of industry or when I'm doing consulting or when I'm giving speeches, you know, you always interact with the people you come in contact with. And something that had kind of surprised me was this mentality on veterans hiring. And I know that uh, certainly for every challenging story, there's a success story that goes along with it. But I have noticed as I've worked with members of the industry, especially at the CEO or the C-suite level, that there does tend to be a little bit of a perspective that not only are veterans a protected class in the mindset of, of C-suite individuals, um, but also that there are challenges that come a, along with military members. And so I guess, you know, when we get to the Q&A part, it doesn't have to be just Q&A with me. I'd love to hear if anybody has some, some experiences. I know Jeff was sharing a little bit about his background at Booz Allen and doing some strategic thinking. So maybe Jeff can weigh in or others can weigh in with what they've seen uh, especially with the challenges with not only recruiting, but retaining military individuals. Cause I, I do see it as a, as a systemic challenge in our country. And I also think that starts when you transition out of uniform and that uh, there's not a consistent training pipeline. It's basically whichever service you're in is going to dictate what you get as you're making that transition. And, and not only just the service you're in, but the location you happen to be in and the unit even um, depending on if you have a successful or a challenged transition to the public sector or to the private sector, excuse me. Um, so that being said, I mean, the reason why I'm thinking about a lot about this is because when you think about the fourth industrial revolution, um, I would submit that military members writ large are, frankly, uh, fairly optimized to, to take part, to be a, a key part of the workforce. And it doesn't have to be anything tied specifically to AI or machine learning or robotics and all the fancy buzzwords that, are, that have been rolling out over the last few years and where people are making significant investments. Uh, I think it's, it's really just the way that uh, the greater use of autonomy, the greater use of data management. I mean, things are moving at an accelerated pace. And so you don't necessarily have a prime position in the marketplace that lasts for decades. You might have a prime position in the marketplace that lasts for a couple of years, and then you're coming under fire from competitors, or you have to be agile and nimble to survive. And that's why I think, you know, counter to what I've heard from some industry leaders, uh, military members are, are ideal for where we find ourselves right now, especially if, if you've got the ones who are willing to work hard. Um, you come out of the service, and I'm sure Master Chief Kingsbury would agree with this. I mean, uh, all you've done, whether it's four years or 30 years in the military, is focus on teamwork, your unit of effort. And I have personally found that to be um, hit or miss in the private sector. Some companies are phenomenal at this. Some organizations are great at this. Others uh, have trouble determining what their strategic vision is and, and how to get everyone aligned uh, and moving in the same direction. I think military members naturally kind of gravitate towards uh, creating order from chaos and working together as a team. So I think that's a competitive strength that mem military members can offer in the private sector or the nonprofit sector. Uh, same thing. I mean, a lot of times, not everybody, but a lot of times uh, you have a above average technical ability and knowledge. Uh, the fact that, and even if you don't, if we're not talking technical, I probably should have called this more like problem solving because you could be uh, working in an administration function or you could be working in a personnel function and you still have to be nimble. You have to be agile. You have to be able to sort of tackle problems that are changing. Your environment's changing usually with you. You're moving from base to base. I mean, everything's new each time. Uh, so I think that's another competitive strength that military members can offer. Uh, same thing, you know, this is a photo of, uh, I think, from around the 1990s at Top Gun. Uh, the guy pictured there as Lieutenant, at the time, Bio Baranek. Uh, he's also a published author who's written about his experience at Top Gun. Uh, you know, this is just, I think, a great photo of what we've all experienced in our military, uh, during our military experience, and that is above average training and standardization. Um, the ability, and in fact, I saw in the chat room, someone had posted about um, working to franchise to help position for leadership opportunities to, to consult, to teach leadership. And, and I'm, I've been pleasantly surprised that there is a tremendous pathway to support companies because once again, 
uh, what we sometimes take for granted uh, that there's a strategic purpose, that there's kind of that mission, vision, guiding principles mindset where everyone understands clearly where the CEO or the organizational leader wants to go may not necessarily be the case, right? So we're very good about standardizing processes moving forward. I, and I suspect from what I've heard from friends who work at Amazon, that's one of the reasons why companies like Amazon love people who come out of the military. Uh, and another area we're really good at just, I think naturally is communication. I mean, I could tell you that when I, and I highlight this in the preface of my book, I mean, when I walked out of high school, uh, I would never tell you I'd be on this call today having this kind of discussion with you, right? I was very shy. Uh, I had pretty much planned that I was likely to go to university of Texas, focus on computer science and maybe get into the computer industry somewhere. And then you get pulled into the military and you have all these incredible experiences. I think in my case, sometimes you could say they're absolutely life changing experiences. They force you to grow, to become more comfortable with who you are. Um, and so you learn these great skills. And one of those skills is communication, the ability to uh, clearly and effectively communicate to those either you lead or you're working for so that the organization can, can thrive during times of challenge. So, you know, that's really the second part I want to talk about. I'd love to hear some feedback. And the reason why this is really, it's not just the veterans workspace. I gave a TED talk recently and something that I had uh, mentioned to the audience there, which I think is really, really critical right now is just when you think about America, right? So let's, let's take a step away from the tactical and go to the strategic and say, you know, America's got a lot of challenges. And I don't think that's going to surprise anybody on this call, right? I mean, you've got nations like China who are seeking to once again contest America's primacy around the world. Of course, you can throw Russia, North Korea, Iran, and uh, terrorism into that bin as well. You also have a situation like we're seeing right now. You saw it kind of play out in the last debate as well between Vice President Biden and President Trump. And that is the fact that we're an incredibly politically divided country right now. It's very difficult for us to gain traction on the big issues, let alone some of the smaller ones. You then throw in what we've been facing for the last, I guess, at this stage, seven or eight months, and that's the COVID-19 pandemic. We still have a lack of, of overall national unity in the face of this pandemic. And then lastly, you throw in something that, of course, underpins America's success historically, and that's our economy. You know, it's, it's long been the engine of our national security and our global prestige, and, and a lot of nations around the world look to America to be a leader. So uh, I think not only can, can veterans in general, but also the members on this, on this Zoom chat and call uh, have a lot to continue to give back to the community. I shot a quick note to, to Heidi. She had mentioned some of the work she's done to continue to serve. Uh, I think there's plenty of people on this call who certainly fit that bill. And I think that, you know, it's incumbent upon us to never wait to make a difference, to use those skills, use those assets to help, uh, whether it's our organizations, our communities, our families, et cetera, as we move forward. So that's it from me. I've talked enough. I'll uh, stop right there. I just throw this up because these are some of the titles for the other chapters in the book. If they resonate with you and you want to ask a question or talk about it, or if it spurs a thought, I'd love to get to it. And I'd certainly, like I've mentioned, um, between me and Jason, I'd love to hear if someone has an experience they want to share of uh, challenges they've seen, but also how people transitioning from uniform overcame those. But thank you. Uh, thank you, Guy. And you know, I, I I did not realize that you'd done a TED talk. I I, I hope uh, if if you've got it at your fingertips that you can um, you can drop the link to that uh, into the chat. If not, uh, by all means, send it to me, and I'll I'll add it to the uh, um, to the the, the follow up. But I, can can you give us a moment, I, just out of curiosity, how how did that happen? How how does a person wind up doing a TED talk? Somebody yeah. So you? don't, uh, let me take one step back. I don't want to oversell it. Right. So yeah. under promise over deliver. It's a TEDx talk. <laughs> um, the defense okay. acquisition university has a annual symposium. And so the, uh, the general who runs it, they'll, they'll kind of pulse throughout the, you know, whatever it is, 2 million members of the active service. And they'll kind of pick out people that they think have uh, the ability to make an impact or, or a message that they can share. And so they'll pick, they'll bring 12 of us in. So like last year, a friend of mine named Mike Kanan, who just published a really good book on artificial intelligence called T minus AI. He spoke last year. And then this year, the, uh, the general uh, had reached out to me to ask if, if I would partake uh, to talk about never waiting to make a difference, right? And ways to make sure that you do that for your organizations. But yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it really is that it's kind of the risk acceptance mindset. That's something that the military has, has kind of gotten bad about is, is uh, wanting to avoid risk, right? Uh, zero defect mentality. Um, I see, I've seen this in industry as well, that it can be challenging depending on how your organization runs to want to take risks because there's not a lot to gain from it, but there's certainly plenty to lose, especially as you get higher into the ranks. 
Uh, but I would say that's, that's been fundamental to kind of getting noticed is being willing to take some risks, throw it out there on the table. And like I mentioned earlier, whether it's writing an op-ed, writing a book, um, you know, finding an avenue to be a public speaker, you kind of throw your ideas out there. And for every person that says, hey, I didn't like what you said, you usually get five to 10 more who say, man, I, I love that. Would you come help us out? And so uh, I think that's, that's how you kind of get noticed in that manner. Well, is your uh, is your talk uh, accessible? Is there a, is there a public link to it? That, uh, that yeah, yeah, I'll think? find the link. I mean, it, it would require you to to confirm that you are in some way, shape, or form affiliated with either the military or an educational institution. But I'll send you the link and I'll leave it over to you. Nice. But as long as you click yes, you can watch it. <laughs> awesome. I, I love this idea of veterans being a protected class. So just grab the next jarhead you meet and tell him he's protected. He'll love that. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this, uh, you know, the story you told at the beginning of your talk, this, this sailor uh, who was killed by the, you know, by the E2 and the hangar deck. And I, you know, I, was a, I was a safety officer for a couple of years, just one of my ships. And it, this just seems to be a recurring theme, right? Like we, we seem to have to learn the same lesson over and over. And we don't really learn it until, you know, and, and, until it happens to one of, you know, to us or one of our shipmates. But from one generation to the next, you know, we, we have a hard time retaining lessons about chocks and chains and stuff that, I mean, how, how do we get around that guy? Yeah, I, well, one, it's a great question. I think that's where uh, diligence comes into play. You know, um, one of the chapters in the book is anticipate problems. It, it's not on the uh, list here, but that's one of them, right? So I think that's a key fundamental responsibility for leaders is to anticipate problems. And once you've determined where you see that, and complacency can be one of those anticipated problems especially as you've seen some of these aircraft carriers or other units that deploy overseas and they're gone for not just maybe five or six months, but seven, eight, possibly even nine months, right? They're setting records right now. Well, when you're away from home port that long, it's very easy to grow complacent. So if you identify that as one of your causal factors for a mishap or, or poor performance, uh, it doesn't even have to lead to a mishap, just bad or underperformance. Um, then you can put controls in place. And I think Master Chief Kingsbury would agree with me that that's, that's where teamwork comes into play. Once again, that's where having a very strong leader, uh, you know, leadership cadre, both officer and enlisted in this case, if you're in the private sector, you know, you're the team you're a part of, uh, finding, so identifying those problems, determining the controls you can put in place. And I think that's something, especially if you serve relatively recently, it's something that we're all used to, right? Operational risk management, ORM. Uh, the fact that you're always thinking about what could go wrong and how do you help prevent it from going wrong and should something go wrong, uh, like an emergency in my aircraft, then what are the steps you have to, t to accomplish right away to, to mitigate any of the, the disaster that might follow? Well, yeah, it's a bit of a recurrent theme here. Yeah, those of you who were with us last week, you'll remember the conversation between my dad and, and uh, Tom Tremble about uh, a fire at the South Pole and same, same deal, right? Anticipating trouble before it shows up at your door. Uh, Guy, what, what is what is your uh, your call sign? Uh, call sign's bus, B U S. Uh, and uh, I, I've got a, <laughs> you know, you, you pilots like busting each other's chops. I've got an anonymous question from the crowd. <laughs> Where did that call sign come from? Uh, yeah. So if uh, and, and Chris, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at you. So um, the, the <laughs> port bus, uh, I got it day one. You know, I walked into the squadron the same day as another guy named James Guimond. So James call sign because of his last name, Guimond, and the training command had been Frenchy. And so the day he showed up, <laughs> uh, we show up the same day, he gets a call sign, you know, the name tag is handed to him. It says white flag, as in the white flag of surrender for the French. And uh, when I showed up, a buddy of mine knew that I had already gone to grad school and had two master's degrees before I even came in to start flying. And so I, my call sign was short bus, as in I'd taken the short bus. And so that worked just fine until one, it's long on the radio, and two, when I was giving a uh, speech at a local middle school, and there were some students um, who uh, had disabilities, uh, you had to kind of change on the fly, and, and it yeah. became, or the cover story <laughs> became that, you know, it was like an opposite call sign, right? So Pittsburgh Steelers were the team to beat at that point in time, and Jerome Bettis was the bus, and who, who's most opposite from Jerome Bettis is me, so um, we shortened it to bus. Fair enough, fair enough. I will, uh, I will allow my, my anonymous questioner to pose his second question on his own. And uh, I, I think I'll give him an opportunity right now. Let me, uh, let me step back and see, let me, let me step back and see if anybody's got, uh, got any questions or comments for Guy. Yeah, Guy, I got, I've got one. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, hey, uh, Jim Ronka, class of 89, uh, Naval Academy. Um, 
you know, I think we've all been students of leadership in our own, our own way, um, you know, since we showed up at the service academies or ROTC, observing good leadership, bad leadership, trying to figure out how we were going to come out of the skills we already brought to those officer training venues from, you know, our childhood um, and or high school. And we use the term leadership to sort of capture a very wide um, skill set. Um, but I think you know, some people can break it down into leadership and management. Mm. And, and uh, you know, you could argue, do they belong together? Uh, or, or should you separate them and, and distinguish between a good leader and a good manager? And, and very seldom do you get both. So when you talk about ORM, uh, safety, you know, one could argue those are management skills um, that, that take, you know, forethought and, and brainstorming and, and scenarioizing. Um, but in your book or in your experience uh, in discussing this topic, do you, what's your opinion about leadership versus management um, in that sense? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thanks, Jim. Um, I don't address that head on in the book, right? Um, it's, it's, it's definitely written for a, for a wide audience, right? And, and I kind of had in mind that I wanted, in, in this case, you to be able to pick it up and say, oh, this is great stuff, but I could also hand it to my 13-year-old and he would love it too because of the anecdotes and stories. Um, I do think that, that you're right, that they're enmeshed in some way, right? It's like quantum entanglement. Um, the fact that you're right, uh, operational risk management by, the, by its very name sounds like a managerial function. But as a leader, if you can use those skills and then turn that into something that's incredibly proactive and then inspire those around you to uh, care about it, to take the actions required. I mean, because you're right. I mean, you can identify issues that you should get out in front of, but if no one does anything about it, then uh, it really is kind of just a managerial function. Uh, when a problem arises, you'll handle it and you'll move on. Um, so I think that's probably in my own mind, how I would, how I would kind of differentiate the two. Um, you know, it, I've always felt like typically like the best leaders I've had are the ones who are just, you know, they've, they're just so, in, they're insightful. They are, uh, wide ranging with their thought, they can bring a lot of great diverse opinions together and they come up with a solution or they come up with something that, that, that the organization should tackle. And then they kind of throw that mile marker way out there and say, that's where we're shooting for like a year and a half from now, but here are all the things we're going to do to get there. And then they get the team on board. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, self-conscious, I guess. I mean, like all of us, right, with our shared backgrounds, you learn very early on, it's ship, shipmate self. Uh, the worst thing to do is, is break off your own arm to pat yourself on the back. But I was very lucky that I had a great commanding officer in front of me. And then when I was in command that we took a squadron from, from truly being perennially the worst, uh, BFA-195, the Dam Busters, um, just, I guess, based on timing and stuff, you know, they'd always been ranked kind of last in the air wing. And then over the course of about two, two and a half years, we, we literally went from worst to first. And I think it's because a lot of the leaders I got to work with, uh, the master chief, the maintenance master chief, um, the executive officer I had, I mean, it was like, you, you just generated that buy-in. So yes, I think a lot of the things that made us successful were likely managerial functions, but it was a way in which we were able to kind of hang those around a leadership forward looking manner of conducting business is what is the only reason we were able to, to grab that mantle. Yeah. And if I, if I could, if I could just jump on that a little bit. So I, I worked for my share of uh, CEOs that uh, were great, leaders by the numbers so their fit reps you know showed all the right numbers of, of safety and, and operational um, um you know fulfilling operational tasks but yet you didn't want to follow them out the front door the <laughs> uh, so you know I, I you know i retired as an 05 so I, I didn't you know i didn't take any 06 uh, leadership positions but but i observed a lot um you know how my bosses were conducting themselves and i just noticed that there seemed to be a difference between how these leaders were graded by, by the metrics of, of a fit rep or, or of operational fulfillment, but yet you know, left a trail of, of blood and tears behind them and, and frankly left a command that was not motivated to, to follow or, or even oftentimes you know, learn helplessness principle where mm -hmm. uh, you just sort of get beat up so much and you, know, you just lie over and, and, and cry uncle. So um, yeah. again, it, it kind of blends into that leadership versus manager and um, you know, we all have our own opinions and there's, a, there's also the, are leaders born or are they made? You know, the academies, I think, seem to think leaders can be made. Um, I, I argue that you can look at a playground of, of kids and, and kind of pick out who your, you know, future leaders are. Um, so I would also be interested to know, you know, what your opinion is about, about leaders made versus leaders born or is it a combination of both? Um, 
Yeah, I, I think I think it is. Uh, I guess it's become more of a loaded term, and I don't mean it that way. But it's, it's like a snowflake, right? Everyone's an indiv- is incredibly unique, and so whether I think that you know leaders can absolutely be made, but I also think it has to be the coalition of the willing, meaning. Um, you're given these experiences, you're given an opportunity to, to kind of grab the mantle of leadership and, and put yourself at risk, do what's right, put service before self. I mean, you know, everybody's faced with those kinds of decision making opportunities every single day, but some people will grab those opportunities. Some people won't. Some people feel compelled to seek positions of higher authority and responsibility. Some people don't. Um, so, you know, it's funny because I remember when I was a junior officer in uh, VFA 131 Wildcats out in uh, Virginia Beach, and we stopped off at the Naval Academy. We we're going to do a flyover for the football game. And my squadron commander was a uh, football player. He, uh, he had been the center for Navy team back in the day. And so he's sitting there with the, you know, not the coach, but the person who ran kind of the Academy Foundation for sports. And they're, they're basically talking about how, you know, the best – senior leaders all have to be basically from a team sports background. And if you didn't have that kind of shared background, then you were going to be a poor leader. But, you know, he, he kind of fizzled as a commanding officer, didn't do great, and then didn't really go on beyond it. And then I've seen people who could be like the biggest computer science nerd growing up. And then suddenly, you know, they, they find something that spark in them and they, and they decide to embrace it. But you're right. I mean, I, I think that's two separate things. One would be, um, does any organization have a, a solid system for correctly evaluating and assessing a person's true leadership capability versus can you game the system? Is it timing? Is it, is it something else? Um, so you're right. On paper, it could look like one thing. In reality, a person could certainly be another. Um, I, you know, in the book, I even talk about the fact that I found that the best organizations I ever was a part of and the way I focused on making my command, both as XO and CO, was was to treat everyone like they're part of your family, right? So you've got people in the family who can be the kind of the problem children, but you still love them. Um, you can, you know, if you're there to serve them, they come first, you come second, all those types of things. Um, you know, I think that that resonates ultimately with people. And it's, you know, we've all seen people who are chasing a fit rep or they're chasing their next rank. And usually, like you said, those are not people you'd ever want to serve with again in the future. 